and the recording for the session will be posted onto the vertical integration website and you have that link and I'll post it back to you um, in an email after the session. During the presentation, please um, mute your microphones unless you are using them uh, and add your questions into the comments box and those will be included in the discussion um, part of this session today. There is an evaluation survey for this session. Uh, I will add a link to that in the chat box and send it out to you in an email after the session. Please do complete that evaluation. It's very important. And that's it from me. I would like to hand over to Lauren, who is going to start her presentation. Thank you, Lauren. Okay. That looks good. Perfect. OK, you're all good. Um, OK, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the preconception console um, and uh, quite a common thing that I do, I guess, but hopefully we can all learn something new from it. Um, so a um, bit of an introduction, my name's Lauren, I'm a GPT2 registrar currently working at Terrigal Medical Centre with Karen. Um, so preconception care, so why is it important? Um, so it has been shown that women and their partners who do receive preconception care are more likely to have positive health behaviours, so decreased smoking, increased use of, of folic acid, and greater participation in antenatal care as well. Um, and there's been shown to be improved neonatal and maternal outcomes. So fewer ne neonatal deaths, prevents neural tube defects, um, decreased risk of congenital abnormalities, decreased risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, fetal abnormalities, um, and as well as increased rates of breastfeeding in women who have sought advice um, in the preconception, uh, in preconception care. Um, also theory about the developmental origins of health and disease. So that's the concept of fetal programming, whereby the intrauterine environment is understood to have a profound impact on a person's entire lifetime health. So for example, um, obesity. And there has been links showing that offspring of mothers who are obese at the time of conception are more likely to be overweight and develop cardiovascular and metabolic disease during their lifetime. Um, plus, it's in the Red Book for Guidelines of Preventative Activities in General Practice. And the recommendation is that every woman of reproductive age should be considered for preconception care. Um, and the quote they kind of give is that this consists of interventions that aim to identify and modify biomedical, behavioural and social risks to a woman's health or pregnancy um, through prevention and management of those risks. And they recommend asking one key question, such as, would you like to become pregnant in the next year to all women of, we, of reproductive age? Um, and this picture just gives a bit of an overview of the periods of major organogenesis. Um, and so even in our area here, I think when most women are quite well engaged in healthcare, we still often don't see them until about the six to eight week marks. And by that stage, there already has been um, it, if they have been exposed to teratogens, a lot of major, major organs have already formed um, and so has already been the potential for malformations very early on. Um, and that other st statistic is a US statistic, but I mean probably fairly similar here in that one in 25 medications prescribed to women of childbearing age um, are potentially damaging to a um, growing fetus. Um, so just a little bit of an overview of the consult to start with, and then I've just focused on um, a few, I guess, more interesting parts of it or just a few more specific things that we might not have learned about before. Um, and medications from the woman and things that are important in the preconception or antenatal 
um, period are things like type 1 and 2 diabetes, hypertension, epilepsy, um, any autoimmune disease or inflammatory bowel disease, thyroid disease, and as well any mental health conditions. Um, and any woman of childbearing age with a chronic medical condition, uh, I, we should try and discuss the importance of pregnancy planning for them um, and just looking at their medications and what would need to happen with them. Um, immunizations are important as well, so specifically rubella, varicella and hepatitis B. Um, and it's recommended to check antibodies prior to conception so that we can give some of those live vaccines if they aren't immune. Um, and so specifically the live vaccines, the MMR or varicella, need to be given at least 28 days prior to trying for pregnancy. Um, so social history, uh, asking about smoking and alcohol. Um, occupation is important for certain exposures. Um, and then family history, uh, asking about any family history of genetic conditions. And I'll talk a little bit later about the genetic carrier screening as well. Uh, and then a bit more specifically is their gynae history. So G's and P's and any complications during prior pregnancies, the delivery or postpartum period, um, and birth spacing in interpregnancy interval as well. And the ideal interpregnancy interval is, is between two and five years, apparently. Um, check whether their cervical screening is up to date, ask a bit more about their periods and just gain whether there is any suspicion that there could be something like polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis that might make falling pregnant a little bit more difficult or indicate need for earlier referral if things were stagnating. Um, ask about current contra contraception that they're using um, and just gain a bit of an idea about fertility awareness, cycle tracking. And these were just pictures of a few apps that are, seem to be quite good. So the Flow app, I think that one's called the Glow app. You can put in your period and it tells them basically when their fertile period is. Um, and then examination, so really a height, weight and getting a BMI, a blood pressure. Uh, it's recommended to have a quick look in their mouth and, and recommend a dental review if they haven't had one in the last 12 months. Um, a thyroid exam is recommended, which admittedly I don't, I'm not very good at. <laughs> um, and then their cervical screening if they're due. And then some other advice that you'd provide during the consult. So healthy diet and exercise in the preconception and pregnancy period. Um, so women classified as overweight, so BMI over 25 or obese with a BMI over 30, um, should be given advice and, and encouraged to set some realistic goals to lose about 5 to 10% of the body weight prior to conception. So would encourage referral to a dietitian as well. Um, and then exercise. So the usual national guidelines are recommended. So 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise most days of the week. Um, and the intensity depends on their baseline level of fitness. And so, for example, Moderate intensity for a woman who's 20 to 29 years old generally would aim for a heart rate about 135 to 150 uh, beats per minute during that 30 minute exercise. And in general, um, it is recommended to avoid contact sports or scuba diving during preconception and pregnancy. Um, and then some more advice about avoiding certain toxins and exposures as well, which I'll go into a bit. Um, the vaccinations that we discussed before, uh, supplements that we're going to recommend, um, and then ordering uh, some blood tests and uh, discussing and offering genetic carrier screen, which is recommended to all women now. Um, okay, so then I'll just talk a bit more specifically about a few, I guess, more common medical comorbidities that women in this age group may have um, and things we might need to think about. So type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and I guess type 2 diabetes very well might become more common um, now. So poor glycemic control is associated with increased risk of miscarriage, congenital malformations, and, and perinatal mortality. And in general, we should try to aim for HbA1c below 6.5% prior to conception. Um, because during pregnancy, if glycemic control is poor, there's also 
acceleration of retinopathy and nephropathy quite quickly as well. And in general, if the HbA1c is above 8%, the risk of birth defects um, goes up quite high and it is recommended that pregnancy is deferred until your glycemic control is improved. Um, and so certain medications that women might be on, so the metformin and sulfonylureas, it's recommended that these are continued in the preconception period, so continued until pregnancy is achieved, and then ideally they should be switched to insulin, um, though I know a lot of the time metformin is continued by the specialist during pregnancy. Uh, but any other oral hypoglycemics should be ceased and switched to insulin prior to conception. Um, women with diabetes are in the higher risk group, so they should be on five milligrams of folic acid, and that's one month prior to conception and throughout the first trimester. Um, and really, ideally, all of them should have a review with their endocrinologist, uh, plus a multi multidisciplinary team prior to conception. So I guess a plan can be made with their medications and make sure that's all optimised. Um, they should have an ophthalmology review as well. Um, and that's because of that high risk of uh, the progression of retinopathy during pregnancy. So should have an ophthalmology review prior to pregnancy and then in each trimester of pregnancy. And if they do already have established retinopathy, that might be more frequent. Um, and then we should just check a baseline EGFR and if that's decreased or there's evidence of albuminuria, then they should be seen by a renal physician prior to pregnancy as well. And so all of this information is in the RACGP type 2 diabetes guidelines. Um, thyroid disease is something that's quite common in this age group as well. So any women with women with hypothyroidism, um, it's recommended basically as soon as they fall pregnant, as soon as they get a positive pregnancy test that their thyroxine dose will need to be increased by 30%. And you'd want them to be seeing their specialist, uh, either the endocrinologist or their obstetrician um, early on in pregnancy as well. And then for women with Graves' disease, uh, PTU is recommended medication in, in preconception and the first trimester. So they might need to be switched over prior to starting to try for pregnancy rather than cabimazole. Um, so for ep women with epilepsy, they're also recommended to have five milligrams of folic acid. Um, and the goal prior to conception is them being on monotherapy, so just one anti-epileptic agent and avoiding sodium valproate um, because sodium valproate has a higher risk of neural tube defects, malformations, cardiac defects, and oral clefts as well. Um, and uh, women with epilepsy as well, I guess just thinking about their contraception. So the enzyme inducing anti-epileptics, which uh, common ones would be phenytoin, carbamazepine or tapiramate, um, they should really only, uh, should be offered either an IED, depot or barrier contraception. And if they must be on the combined oral contraceptive pill, then they need to be on the high dose, 50 micrograms of estrogen. The non-anti-epileptics are generally, so things like sodium valproate, gabapentin, levetiracetam are generally fine with oral contraception. Um, but lamotrigine is a bit of a special case, so that's a non-inducer, but there's evidence that the combined pill lowers your lamotrigine levels in the blood, and so it ends up with a lower seizure threshold. Um, and then the only other thing with that is uh, emergency contraception as well. So for the women on enzyme-inducing antiepileptics, you either need to do a double dose of the oral levonorgestrel, so you and you can't use Uli Bristol as it's not effective, um, or the copper IED. Um, and then mental health conditions are, are really common as well. So this information is just from um, an, an NPS article about antidepressants in pregnancy, which was good. Um, so uh, in general, you would use an SSRI ideally. Every antidepressant has been associated with some neonatal effects, um, but there's no real consistent data across multiple trials. Uh, so 
With SSRIs, some trials showed increased risk of birth defects, though this wasn't statistically significant, um, as well as shorter gestational length and lower birth weight. Um, and post-delivery, there has been shown to be increased re risk of mild respiratory distress, irritability and feeding problems. And it's not clear whether this is from withdrawal or toxic effects from the medication, but all of those are self-limiting and have generally settled by 14 days. Um, so some psychiatrists prefer fluoxetine because of its longer ha uh, half-life and so potential for slower neonatal withdrawal effects but others prefer shorter acting like citalopram or fluvoxamine, sertraline, um, as the maternal response is faster. Uh, so in general, I guess we just stick to SSRIs, though avoiding paroxetine because of the potential for, for malformations. Um, uh, Lauren, could, yeah. uh, there's just a question here in the um, chat yeah. um, just uh, related to folate. So there's just, is there a reason not to offer or recommend the five milligrams folate to all women from the time of pregnancy intention. So any thoughts there? Because obviously there's high risk groups we use it, so epilepsy, risk of spina bifida, diabetes, so there's a whole lot of groups. Mm. But um, yeah, is there any reason that you're aware of? Um, no, not that I'm aware of. I think I, 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 from what I read, I guess it's just, it, it's not needed. I go into folic acid a, li a little bit more a bit later, but I, I'm, not I'm not really sure about that, whether it's worth trying that for everyone. Cool, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so in the pre in, with antidepressants in the preconception period, if depression has receded, you could consider a trial of cessation of medication. Um, but in an unplanned pregnancy, so some women will abruptly cease their medication because of the concerns regarding safety in pregnancy, but up to 75% of women who do so may develop a recurrence of their depression before delivery. And so it's generally advised to continue. Um, and you weigh up the risk versus benefit, I guess, with maternal depression and anxiety. So depression in itself has been shown to be associated with a, a slighter, shorter gestational length and lower birth weight. Um, and this article talked about increased behavioral problems and learning difficulties at five years old in boys with depressed mothers who showed ambivalence towards them in the first few months, which is quite specific. But, um, and women with postnatal depression as well are more likely to stop breastfeeding earlier. Um, and the antenatal anxiety was associated with raised cortisol in um, their 10 year old offspring. Uh, and those were just some good resources for looking at medications uh, in preconception and pregnancy. So, Mother Safe is the local. Um, I think it's the Southeastern Sydney Health District um, has that one and they've got a phone line that can be called as well. And then the top one was a US site and the bottom one is a Canadian one, but they've got good handouts that can be given to the women as well to help them decide the risks and benefits of certain medications. Uh -uh. Okay, and then so I was just going to talk a little bit, I guess, about a just a, an example case I had. So last year I was working as an obstetric RMO in the Northern Territory. So it's a different demographic. Um, but so one of our patients we had was an Aboriginal woman in her early 30s who had end stage renal failure and was on three times weekly dialysis plus very poorly controlled type two diabetes. Um, and she just by chance mentioned to a dialysis nurse at one of her sessions that she was pregnant. Um, and by this stage, she was 16 weeks pregnant. So she'd been on multiple teratogenic medications, so ACE inhibitor, statin, diuretics. She hadn't had any first trimester screening, despite being very high risk. Um, and she, she'd known that she was pregnant for at least six weeks or so before that. And she couldn't understand what all the fuss was about and why everyone was so stressed about this. Um, and so I guess she was seeing multiple specialists. She'd been attending, like seeing a lot, had a lot of involvement with healthcare practitioners. Um, and obviously something's gone wrong where it, it, either conception or her reproductive health wasn't brought up, or likely it was, but possibly a long time ago, and then it was never rediscussed really as things progressed. Um, so I guess important to remember that there's a pretty huge range of health literacy in Australia, um, not to assume, and, and I guess it'd be easy for us to just assume that a woman specialist has had that discussion with them, but often they're learning so many new things there that 
um, and they might not take that part in. So it, things like the cervical screening visits or contraceptive visits in, important to us. Women about their reproductive plan so that a plan can be in place before they fall pregnant. Um, okay, and then a little bit about environmental exposures in the preconception period. So um, do ideally want to avoid things like lead, mercury, pest pesticides, herbicides and radiation, and in the home, paint thinners, strippers, solvents, and if these need to be used, then using good PPE. Um, some other common things that women might ask about that I don't didn't know about, so hair dyes, uh, there's been no harmful outcomes that have been noted with hair dyes and same with women who are hairdressers. There's just minimal absorption through the skin. Um, tanning products are generally safe, though for spray tans, it's recommended that women use nose plugs and masks. <laughs> um, and then Botox, generally advised to avoid. So Botox that's injected into the muscle are very unlikely to, res to reach the circulation and it doesn't cross the placenta. So inadvertent exposure during pregnancy is generally fine, um, though because it, it Botox is a well, cosmetic Botox is not medically necessary procedure. There haven't been large trials about it. It's generally not recommended. Um, and then cosmetic uh, and acne treatments, so benzoyl peroxide and salicylic acid in small amounts are, are generally safe, but we should avoid topical retinoids, minoxidil or hydroquinone. Um, in terms of the vitamin A or retinol that's present in the over-the-counter cosmetics, um, it's generally present in insignificant quantities and is minimally absorbed through the skin. So it, it's, it, um, Mother Safe says that it, it, that's acceptable to use. Um, but un any unbranded products or things brought over the internet should generally be avoided. Um, and then generally we'd recommend some blood tests. So uh, similar to antenatal, I guess, full blood count, a blood group and screen, um, some infectious serology, and then you want to check the rubella and varicella serology to see if any vaccinations are needed. Uh, and I couldn't find any specific guidelines about what other things to add in. So the RANSCOG guideline just says, consider these other extra bloods based on history and exam. So uh, this is mainly based on recommendations for antenatal, uh, like first trimester screening and as to who we do these extra blood tests on. So uh, ferritin, any woman who's had previous iron deficiency, if they've had a recent pregnancy, all teenagers, any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander women, any women who've had bariatric surgery, um, inflammatory bowel disease, a low MCV and their full blood count, or women who are vegetarian. Uh, we should check vitamin D for any dark thin women, office workers, or women who wear hijabs. And then thyroid, a TSH, um, you'd end up checking for quite a lot of our population. So any signs or symptoms of hypothyroidism, including a goiter. If there's any family history of thyroid disease or family history of any autoimmune disease, such as celiac. Um, or if the woman herself has any past medical history of any other autoimmune disease. If they've been on medications like amiodarone, lithium, um, any history of miscarriage or preterm delivery or infertility, and also anyone who's over 30 who, or who has a BMI over 35. So it ends up quite a big population who gets a TSH. Um, to check a, a BSL or a HbA1c, or you could do an OGTT, uh, anyone with those risk factors for GDM. So if they've had gestational diabetes in a previous pregnancy, previous large baby, um, age over 39, BMI over 30, uh, a history of polycystic ovarian syndrome, family history of diabetes, and then uh, any ethnicities, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, Asian, Maori, Middle Eastern or African women. Um, so screening for thalassemia, if their full blood count is suspicious, so if they have an MCV below 80 and, or an MCH below 27, especially if they're not ferritin deficient, they should be screened for thalassemia. If there's any family history of thalassemia and then ethnicity as well is important. So it's another, I guess, ethnicity 
is another thing important thing to ask about in preconception consult so that would be any women mediterranean women middle eastern african asian maori pacific islanders south american and aboriginal and torres strait islander communities specifically in northern western australia and the northern territory and then an sti screen should definitely be offered to women under 30 but it is recommended to offer to all women Okay, and then a little bit more about supplements. There's lots of options out there. So folic acid, all women should have four to 500 micrograms of folic acid four weeks prior to conception and throughout the first trimester. And so this is for prevention of neural tube defects. And then high risk women, we recommend that five milligrams. So that's if they've had a previous pregnancy with neural tube defects, if they're on any of those anticonvulsant, history of diabetes or malabsorption, and any women with a, B, a BMI over 30, which would end up quite a few women as well. So yeah, I'm not sure why specifically we don't offer that to everyone. I imagine it's just because it's not needed. Um, iodine should also be recommended for all women, so 150 micrograms throughout the pregnancy and breastfeeding period, and that's needed for um, protection of maternal thyroid hormone plus the fetal brain and CNS development. Um, vitamin D if they're deficient, so 1,000 units if their vitamin D is 30 to 49, 2,000 daily if it's under 30, and that reduces the risk of a, a small for gestational age baby and impaired fetal skeletal development. Um, iron in, if they're deficient and you need at least 60 milligrams of iron daily. Um, vitamin B12 should be recommended for all vegans and vegetarians. Um, so you can have an oral tablet or the IM vitamin B12 and that prevents infant neurological sequelae. And then calcium, if they've got an inadequate dietary intake. So I guess just getting a bit of an idea what their diet's like. Um, sorry, that should say at least a thousand milligrams daily. And that's for prevention of preeclampsia. And Lauren, there's lots in the chat. Oh, here you go. You've probably got a table here of all the different types. But there's lots in the chat about obviously the elevate and the pregnancy black moors and mm. how much folate's in those and how much iodine, etc. So, and that might be another reason it, why it's recommended that we have the 500 rather than the five milligrams because that's what's in lots of the preparations. Um, mm. Except obviously with the high risk one, that's where they've got to um, yeah, seek out the five milligram. But, um, that's a good table. <laughs> Yeah, this, I, I started to make a table with a few of the different um, common prenatal ones and then I deleted it. They're all pretty similar. Most mm -hmm. seems, in terms of folic acid, most seem to have about seven or 800 micrograms um, and, most, and, and have sufficient iodine and then most have some iron in it and then about 20 other little nutrients as well. This one's just an iron table that's pretty good I think that's from the South Australia guidelines but most of these would have sufficient dose of iron if, for a woman who's iron deficient um, and then I was just going to talk a little bit about uh, methylated folate which is a bit trendy so this was just a fake case but it's probably not all that uncommon so Jenny 28 year old female recently underwent gene testing with her naturopath and has learned that she has the MTHFR677TT genotype, so two copies of the mother FRC67T variant. Um, she's trying to fall pregnant and after reading online is confused about what prenatal supplement she should be taking. So what should we tell her? Um, and this kin is one of the prenatal supplements. Oh, I think they do a lot of women's health stuff um, that's kind of really come on board with the methylated folate and they push that. Um, so I didn't know anything about the MTHFR gene, so I just used this to learn a little bit more about it. Um, so in regards to preconception, I just really looked into it in terms of preconception and the folic acid. Um, the, oh, but I did talk a little bit. So the, the gene itself has, the testing for it has increased in recent years, by both alternative health practitioners and GPs. Um, and the polymorphisms have been weakly associated with a lot of things. So autism, schizophrenia, cardiac disease, 
the fetal tube, neural tube defects and some poor pregnancy outcomes. Um, so I, I really just looked into in terms of the folic acid and neural tube defects. So in regards to preconception and folic acid supplementation, so the MTHFR gene uh, produces the MTHFR enzyme, which helps convert folic acid into the active form of folate that circulates in our blood basically. Um, and there's two predominant polymorphisms, so the 677T and the A1298C variant. Um, and this pictures just how it would be inherited. That's the TT variant. Um, and so the two polymorphisms, um, so in the general population, 60 to 70% of individuals will have at least one of these variants. About 8% will be homozygous for the 677T or the 1298C, and about 2% will be compound heterozygous. So it's a pretty big proportion of the population that will have some kind of polymorphism. And the theory is that those with the polymorphism need to take an alternative, alternative form of folate, so that um, methylated folate or 5-MTHF, uh, in the, the one in that kin supplement, as they will be unable to process the folic acid and convert it to the active form of folate. Um, but the evidence shows that those with the 1298C polymorphism, there's no evidence that this has an impact on folate conversion. For the 677T polymorphism, so if you're homozygous, that is thought to mildly reduce the, your enzyme production, which converts um, to the active folate. Form, um, but the blood levels of folate are only about 16% lower than those without. So it doesn't really make a difference. Um, basically, RANSCOG and the CDC guidelines do not recommend that those with any of the polymorphisms need to take an alternative form of folate at this time. Um, and that's, I think, mainly because folic acid is the only form of folate that has been shown to help prevent neural tube defects at this time in, in all of the studies. Um, and even those with the polymorphism can still process folic acid. Um, and also at this stage, the evidence doesn't support that these women need to take a higher dose of folic acid. Um, some research has shown that there's a high incidence of neural tube defects in populations with the 677T polymorphisms, but those studies were done in countries without folic acid fortification in food. Um, and other studies have shown significant drop in neural tube defects, so se about 70% with population level fortification of folic acid in the food. Um, so I, 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 I don't know much about like the kin supplement. I suspect that it's not harmful. It's just that it hasn't been done in widespread trials to prove that it does prevent um, neural tube defects, but theoretically it should still be fine but I think it's a fair bit more expensive and probably isn't necessary. Um, okay, and then I was just gonna talk a little bit about genetic carrier screening. So the RANSCOG guideline now recommends that um, all women should be offered genetic carrier screening at least for CF, spinal muscular atrophy and fragile X syndrome um, in the preconception or the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, and the RACGP guideline recommends that we take a good family history from women. Any women who have a family history of any genetic condition should, should be made aware of it. Um, and it should be considered, it basically should be considered to be offered for any other women, even if they don't so any other low risk women, regardless of their family history. Um, and it is, in, it, is, it is important, I guess, regardless of family history, because almost 90% of carriers of CF, spinal muscular atrophy and fragile X syndrome have no known family history of the condition. Um, and so Mackenzie's mission has brought genetic carrier screening, I guess, to the forefront in recent years. So Mackenzie was a baby born in 2017 and at 10 years old was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy, which is a severe inherited neuromuscular condition with no known cure. 
And so her parents had no family history of any genetic conditions. They'd undertaken all of the recommended preparations to have a healthy child. They'd never heard of SMA and were not aware that they were both carriers. Um, and so Mackenzie passed away when she was seven months old um, and her parents basically started a campaign hoping that no other couples would have to face this. And they launched a camp campaign for reproductive carrier screening to be routine and free for all pr prospective parents in Australia. Um, and in 2018, they received $20 million funding from the government and their trial was aiming to recruit 10,000 couples to be enrolled um, and screen for 750 severe childhood onset genetic conditions. And the aim of the study was to provide evidence um, for making free reproductive carrier screening for available to all women in Australia who want to have it. Um, and in March this year, the federal government did announce a new plan to make genetic carrier screening for those three genetic conditions, CF, SMA and Fragile X free from next year. Um, so I don't know whether that will happen, but I guess at some point in the future, it's likely it might. So what's the cost at the moment, Lauren? Is it 400 or? Um, I've got a little bit later a few, there's a few different companies who do it. So it kind of depends on which, which whether you want to do the, th the screw three gene screening or um, the extended panel. So I've got a few examples a bit later. Great. Um, so yeah, so your options for screening. So most providers offer either the three gene screening uh, for CF, SMA and Fragile X or um, the expanded carrier screening and a few of them have different names for that. Um, and this is just a, an example, I guess a reminder. So you're screening for genetic recessive conditions and X-linked conditions. So uh, the recessive condition, if if both parents happen to be carriers and, and they very well might not know about that, um, one in four children will be affected by the condition. So the X-linked conditions, if the mother was a carrier, uh, one in two of her male offspring would be affected and one in two of her females would be a carrier. Um, so with the three gene screening options, so cystic, I guess why it's important. So cystic fibrosis is the most common life-limiting genetic condition in Australia. Spinal muscular atrophy is the most common genetic cause of death in Australian children under two years old. And fragile X syndrome is the most common cause of an inherited uh, intellectual disability. Um, and then so many, a lot of the companies also offer this expanded carrier screening and most of them screen for about 400 recessive and X-linked conditions. So um, Sonic had like a huge, huge list of everything it screens for, but things like Tay-Sachs disease, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, Allport syndrome, retinitis pigmentosa. Um, and in general, the options are either sequential screening. So that's a fair bit cheaper and is where the female is screened first. And then the partner's only screened if the female is found to be a carrier of the recessive condition, um, or you can do couple screening, which is obviously more expensive. So both partners are tested simultaneously, um, but it does generally require less genetic counselling as the chance of both partners carrying the same genetic condition is much lower. Um, and it also saves time. So if you are screening in the first trimester, a lot of them are kind of two week turnaround. So if, if you're screening in the first trimester and you screen the woman and she happens to be a carrier and then you've got to screen the man if, if, like four weeks have passed and if it if you are needing to screen baby it, it I guess it's a lot of anxiety but you're further on in the pregnancy as well um and this was an RACGP article I guess if if a couple is found that they're both carriers what options are there so their options were not having children um adoption, donor eggs or sperm, I guess the most common things would be the last two. So if the woman's already pregnant, you would offer um, testing the pregnancy with amniocentesis or CVS. And then in the preconception period, so ideally it's done preconception because then there is the option to do IVF with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. 
um, and this one's a bit busy, but the that table, I think that table's from the Sonic website. So that gives an idea of the numbers or the chance of positive screening for individuals. So uh, one in 30 people are actually carriers for CF. So it's not uncommon that someone would come up positive. And with the three gene screening, about one in 20 individuals will test positive to at least one of these as a carrier. Um, with the expanded carrier screening, and so it depends on the company and how many genes they screen for, but about 75% of Australian individuals are identified as carriers for one or more disorders. So it, you, there's a good chance that they'll be positive for something when you test for that many things, I guess. Um, and so, and the process would be given most people do sequential screening mainly because of the cost. If the female's positive for a genetic mutation, you then recommend the partner is screened. And so with Sonic Genetics, who um, go, Douglas Hanley Moore goes through Sonic Genetics, um, if the female's found to be positive, they do offer free screening just for that specific gene for the male partner. And they've got a specific form that you use for male partner screening. Um, and they, they do also offer genetic counselling, one genetic counselling session free if, if both partners in the couple is found to be high risk. So I should put it on the slide, I can add that later. But so for Sonic through DHM and uh, I mean, I, if for women who've wanted it, I've just gone through them because DHM is available locally. Um, but the three gene chest is $385 and their Beacon expanded carrier screening is $595. Um, the, so this is this um, picture is from the McKenzie's Mission website. And that's all the Australian providers who do the genetic carrier screening. Um, and most of them, like Sonic, definitely has quite a good website and patient handouts, but also information for us as well as to costs and what the process is and, and you know, numbers of how many people will test positive. Um, this Eugenie website is actually quite good. Um, so they only offer the expanded carrier screening. It's a fair bit more expensive. So theirs is $795 for individuals or $995 for couples. Um, you just do a saliva test. You can order it yourself online. Um, and they even had a Black Friday sale last week. But every patient is offered pre-test and post-test genetic counselling by geneticists. So, um, I mean, when I've done it, I think so far the patients I've ordered it for only one of the three gene screening. But I don't know if you'd be better off if you're doing the expanded screening or at least trying to steer them for something like this because if 75% are going to test positive for something and I don't know much about all those other conditions and I think they probably need to have someone or someone who knows more involved. And Lauren, there's also some concerns Steve um, mentioned regarding privacy as well. Mm. Um, in terms of yeah, where does all this data go in terms of insurance companies? Mm. So, um, it's a tricky one. It's a, yeah, um, no. <laughs> they're like they're kind of forcing us to offer it because the Ranscog recommendation. But I feel like it is a a big thing. Um, Sonic did have a a patient handout about implications for your health insurance. Um, the um. I was going to mention, I've just put a useful um, link as well. The RACGP had some training around carrier screening mm. and um, one of the links on there is the genomics and general practice um, guidelines uh, because I think it's really important point you made around, um, I guess that because we're doing a lot more of this testing is the role of the GP in that counselling and just being really clear that we've out, like this, I think it's on page four, it has a nice little summary of the genetic counselling, which is really easy to read for a GP, but just really explaining particularly the risk to other family members. So if you're getting tested, what does that mean for your sister or your brother or your offspring? And, you know, just and do you tell them about it? Do you not tell them about it? All that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, with the, all these tests coming out, we've got to be really careful. Uh, Lauren, it's Karen. Yeah. Yeah, um, I have only probably used the expanded on one occasion and that's because the family already were carriers. 
So there was an affected person already. Um, and we actually got a limited screen looking just for that gene rather than actually doing the full one. And they gave them a quote from Sonic on doing it. It wasn't much more expensive than the three. So um, that was really helpful. I have great concerns about um, doing the full screen when you've got 75% of the population being yeah. carriers for something because it just, you know, as Chris was saying, increases that angst and anxiety about about falling pregnant before these women and and, par and couples actually even think about it. So, um, yeah, and unfortunately it, is an, it, it, it relatively is an expensive test, so only those who can afford will do it and those people are already anxious anyway, so I tend to downplay it as much as possible if we can. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, and then I just had a a quick little bit about preconception care for men, which I haven't had any men come in asking for preconception care yet. Um, but in terms of important things in their history, so um, obesity, diabetes, cystic fibrosis, um, history of varicocele, dwarfism, infection trauma, previous chemo or radiotherapy, can it be associated with reduced sperm quality and possible subfertility? Um, and any man who's had chemo, radiation or radionuclide treatment should be discussed with their specialist as often though they should wait three months afterwards before trying to fall pregnant. Um, medications, calcium channel blockers, phenytoin, steroids, tetracyclines or exogenous testosterone can all affect sperm quality and count. Um, you want to ask about family history, I guess the genetic conditions, but also Klinefelter's or polycystic kidney disease can impair uh, fertility and sperm quality as well and then paternal exposures so alcohol and some recreational drugs are associated with reduced fertility but there's no evidence of birth defects um, and workplace exposures as, as well there's no evidence of association between a father's workplace and birth defects um, and you want to do some health promotion for men as well so maintaining a healthy weight as obesity is associated with decreased testosterone levels Reducing stress, uh, as stress can disrupt the HBO axis. And then promotion of good mental health as well. As fathers with good mental health, there's a decreased effects of mother's depression on her child, I guess, because they can help out and take on that role as well. Um, okay, and that's all I had. It's a bit of a lazy reference guide. But in terms of the preconception con consult, there's a quite a good AJGP article. And then the South Australia perinatal practice guidelines have quite a good summary as well of things to order. Um, and then there was bits, yeah, the GP learning on genetic carrier screening is good as well. Um, Health Pathways has a bit of a summary. And then there was just a few other resources there too. Well, thank you, Lauren, that was great. There were so many little gems there. So I certainly learned a lot more, especially in regards to the carrier screening. And there's so many little controversies as well, I find, like especially with, we've been checking a lot of more TSH um, mm -hmm. prenatally as well. And it's hard when you've mentioned that the guidelines can differ between the um, gynae colleges and the College of General Practitioners, and it can be really confusing. So, and I'm not sure, I haven't actually checked the health pathways for um, preconception care. Um, I don't know if anyone's looked at that to see how clear that is. Um, I, I know I have for various conditions like subclinical hypothyroidism, but um, I must have a look at that as well. Any other questions? I might just reinforce that, um, Georgia, just that the thyroid is definitely the one that, so you've got the guidelines and I think the health pathways is exactly consistent with uh, what you just presented, Lauren, and, and I agree, excellent presentation, thank you. Um, but then I find that you've got the guidelines, but then I've gone to talks with obstetricians who say, no, you should screen everyone. And if you're an infertility expert, then everyone gets a thyroid. <laughs> so it's really hard. So I think I tend to stick with the guideline, obviously. But um, yeah, I think you have to take each case and then sometimes deviate from guidelines if it's appropriate. But um, yeah, no, it's very tricky as a GP because you've got lots of different and sometimes guidelines don't keep up with research, as we all know. So. Yeah, and we try and be rational with our blood test ordering. Yeah. And then when you do send them to the gynecologist, then they do, you know, all the obstetrician, 20,000 tests. And you think, oh. <laughs> so it is hard. We try and do the right thing. <laughs> so, and everyone's praising um, your talk, Lauren, with fantastic presentation and great summary. 
Um, and yeah, and the other point is too with the genetic screening. And I find that with the um, NIPT test, it's hard if patients can't afford it. Mm -hmm. um, or offering the Bexero to patients, it's really mm -hmm. quite stressful because we, we, we're supposed to recommend it, but um, if they can't afford it, it's um, you know there can be guilt associated with the family. So it is it is tricky. Um, now, can, can I, Georgia? Can I just yes. um, yeah, um, Lauren? Just like to thank you for that. That's uh, a really good presentation and, and really thorough. It's really good to see that your experience prior to coming into general practice training um, has helped many of us who have been doing this work for many years with some, as as um, Georgia said, pearl, uh, gems, or I call them pearls. If you can walk away from any of these presentations with just one good thing or one thing that's new, it really enforces that um, it's worthwhile sitting down and listening to the to the champions, which you are. Yeah. And that, that was really, really thorough. It was really good to hear a lot of your experience as well and, um, you know, very thorough resources as well. It was good to look at that mother FR um, <laughs> gene and how stressful that has brought into our practice and uh, the difficulties really with trying to balance what somebody's um, needs are and what their wishes are and what others' wishes are for them. And it is a stressful time when people are really thinking about what's going to be best for them. So congratulations. And I think this um, talk would be really, really helpful for all med students and registrars and GPs. So we should really spread it afar. Thank you. Yeah. And that's a good sequelae into my next um, plug, which is for next year. So this is our last medical integration session for this year. So next year for the first half, we're looking at filling in seven, seven slots. And we have loved especially having the registrars. I think their talks have been amazing. So we'd love any registrars to put their hands up as well as any GPs. We've got any, it doesn't have to be too fancy. It can be based on a case study or any special interest. But um, we hope to hold them every year. We, second Wednesday morning, we've got some dates set out for the next year. So please put your hand up and we'd love to um, have you run a session. Um, but they've been fab fabulous. And if, if anyone has any any sessions, they're all on the PHN website as well, so you can go and watch them. Um, but, um, yes, but just email or write in the chat box if you want to put your hand up. But, um, yes, we'd love to see you um, present um, next year. They've been amazing so far. And then in the new year, we're also planning to do some more GP clubs as well. In um, That was in March and June. So stay tuned for GP clubs, and that's a great chance for us to meet face-to-face. So, um, so I've seen Sandy's put the link for the evaluation as well, but um, I think we can have um, an early an early mark so we can get on with the day. But I hope everyone has a Merry Christmas um, and I'll hand you over to um, Sandy to wrap everything up. Yes, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. That was a fantastic presentation, Lauren. Really excellent. Yes, I put the link for the evaluation. Please do put uh, do complete that. And there is a section there for you as well to let us know other topics that you're interested in. Um, and you can also put your hand up to present as George has requested. But um, it remains for me to say um, good morning and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, if I could just ask the committee and Lauren to hang on with us. Bye, everybody.